John, good morning. Thanks a lot for coming and joining me here in my shop on the 5th of November. And I'm going to start out by saying one of the great pleasures of making these videos is uh, finding out how stupid you can be and doing it in public. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great experience. So how stupid can I be? This stupid. That's stupid. That's how stupid I can be. So I think in the first video, uh, I discovered that there was a cold push on off switch over here. Then somehow that just disappeared from my mind. And I continued on fascinated by the fact that this knob has a very sudden stop to it. How, how, how close was I to remembering? <laughs> you pull it out. You push it in. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the uh, email I got pointing out that, hey man, you already know about that switch. What happened? <laughs> what happened? You know, that, that is a, I, I, I find this very interesting when I make dumb mistakes or my thinking process goes off track. I, I find that fascinating too, just as fascinating as the radio, maybe even more fascinating. And it's my own head, and I assume. I assume what happens to me happens to everybody. I don't think I'm anything out of the ordinary. I'm just a run-of-the-mill human being here on the planet. But it does lead me to think about the other side of the same coin, which is, uh, how did I forget this? How do you ever remember anything? And it's not so much the fact that you can remember stuff, uh, you know, because of the way things are. We can easily kind of except that there's a storage system somewhere in our heads. It's the retrieval part that I find just fascinating. So if I say to you, uh, a big beautiful tree you used to see all the time when you were a kid, chances are you generated an image in your mind of such a tree. Chances are really good you did. And maybe even in that image with the tree is the remainder of the property, the yard, the area, some other things you might see in your mind's eye. Just about like that. Just about like that. And I, I'm the one who generated it just by saying something. And it's, I'm not even there with you live. You're watching a recording of me saying this. So when I said some tree in past in your life, it could be anything, of course. It, you just picked on a tree for some reason. Did you have the experience of going down a long hallway, opening the door, entering a room full of shelves, walking along the shelves, then picking a row and walking down the row, then climbing up a ladder to pull out a particular book, and opening the book, leafing through the pages, and then looking down and finding the picture of the tree? Do you have any sensation whatsoever that anything like that happened in your mind when I said tree? And if a tree didn't work, something else would work, of course. For me, the answer is absolutely not. I, I have more a feeling of the memory just welling up virtually instantly into my mind. And this happens all the time to us, day and night, all the time. We don't think anything of it. And like a lot of things, if you just don't stop to think about some of these things that, that we do as humans, you overlook the wonder that we ourselves are. Even if some of us are able to forget about the on-off knob. <laughs> okay, so just trying to make as much of life. You, you know, when I was a kid, and I think when, when most people were kids, most people were kids, by the way, at one point. Um, there was a certain magic in, in the world, a certain mystery, a certain excitement. Just being out, just just being just being among you know in your backyard or park or wherever it is you used to go when you were a kid, and just hearing and seeing stuff and running around doing stuff. There just seemed to be a little bit of an element of magic behind it all. And you know, I'd like to retain that as much as possible. So a long time ago, I heard this wise Sam saying, never be childish, always be childlike. 
and uh, that's certainly a principle I've tried to follow all my life and look for those opportunities to be childlike but not childish okay I think that's it for speeching thank you for pointing that switch out I'm gonna leave it shorted the way it is for now and down the road I'll cut away the short and uh, we'll find out if the uh, switch works I don't think we ever did find out if the switch worked or not let's turn this guy right over today is capacitor day capacitor day let's see what all is going to be involved in that Okay, so I did the power supply capacitors, but now we're talking more about the signal capacitors, of which there is one, two, three, and four, and there's a whole bunch piled up in this package here, which apparently works because I was able to play the radio and hear stuff. Is all the part are all the parts that are in here performing properly? Well, probably not, but performing well enough seem to be. So we're really just left with this guy, this guy, and these two. So this one is an important one. It goes from goes from what I think is a long circuitous route. It goes over to here. In fact, I'm not sure. It's snaking its way through various pieces of wire. I probably mistraced it just now. It's also a black wire, black wire here connected to this uh, to this large uh, chassis lug. Where does that go? It goes up here. This Hunt's capacitor is hooked up one side to it, and there looks like there's another. There's a resistor underneath there. Uh, maybe we need to take a closer look at this. Maybe you'll look at the schematic a little bit. Let me try to identify these. These uh, There's only a couple capacitors here. There's one down this way. There's only a couple up at this end. And that's the, uh, that is the, what is that? Tube there. Let's find out. Well, that's the rectifier tube. Capacitors around the rectifier tube. Somehow I had it in my head they were well, the front end of the radio is also up here, and it could be some of these terminals on the uh, rectifier tube are actually spare and just being used as hookup terminals. It gives a very confusing look to, to the layout of the components underneath the radio. Um, but I kind of like to do is try to detect some kind of. Uh, Improvement. I don't think I'm going to do that. And that, that's just I've tried that numerous times. And uh, mm, as I replace capacitors, do I hear any improvement? You know, I, I guess unless I really set up a really well done quantitative approach to that, it's it's pretty tough. You know, unless the radio is going from dead to life, then you, then you know. But just a general improvement in its performance, it's really very hard to uh, come to grips with. So I think I'm just going to go ahead. And Change these three. Wasn't there four? Yeah, four. Change the four of them. Now we're going to play the radio and get on with uh, doing an alignment. Well, that's something he just said like six different things I'm going to do here. I'm going to look at the schematic. Let's see if we can find these. This one's a little bit suspicious. Well, maybe not. Oh, I can't forget about this little Hunts guy back here. I'm going to forget about him. No, don't forget about them. It's not an on-off switch. It's not, it's not like that. Okay, let's see how this works out. This capacitor here would be this capacitor here. 0.047, that's what's written on, on this guy. 0.047. Now this guy, 0 .0 point, that's 400 volts. That says. Well, it looks like looks like point zero something seven. And if we look on the schematic, we see another one right here. Point zero four seven. This one connects to, and this is this is an odd arrangement here for me anyway. 
This one connects to pin 6 of the rectifier tube. So the rectifier tube's here. Pin 6 is right there. Right there. And this capacitor is hooked up to it. The other side of this capacitor is hooked to this terminal. So is this capacitor hooked to this terminal. This is a rectifier tube with spare terminals on it of two and one. So two and one are available to the designer as just hookup terminals. And that's what he's done here. He's taken two and he's hooked these capacitors and this black wire to it. And he's also using one, by the way, as a hookup terminal. Nothing to do with the tube itself. So let's take a look at what this guy is doing here. What exactly is he up to and what is going on with the heater there? Um, th this, like I mentioned, is a bit of an unusual arrangement. Because you kind of expect one side of the heater string to go to one side of the outlet, or one side of the inlet, I guess I could say, the power plug. And then you expect the other side to hook up to the end here. They're hooking up. They're hooking up in the midpoint. That's very curious to me. Um, my understanding is these rectifiers, this one here, 35W4, uh, this um, uh, center tap is not in the center. It's designed to drop about 6 volts across one leg and the remaining 35, which would be 29 volts, across the other leg. That's my understanding of it. And this is a sneaky way to produce 6 volts to run a light. And many of these radios have a light hooked up this way. Um, but that's not what's going on here. The light in this radio is this panelescent thing, which is which is uh, quite independent of uh, where where is it? Where to go? Oh, I don't know where it is now. It's in here. Here it is. Here it is. It's over here. It's here. So it's hooked up right from line to line. On all the time. I just realized. It's just it's on all the time. Of course it's on all the time. This is a clock radio, and so this is very faintly lighting the back of the clock, which would look pretty cool if it worked. But I don't think it does. So how does this work? Then this means they're rectifying. This is the, let's think of this as a return, trying to get back to this. Well, it depends how you want to look at it. Um, I won't use the word return. So there's the rectifier, but it's not hooked directly. So it's hooked through this filament. That would mean the DC flowing in the, uh, each of these tubes, the actual plate current in each of these tubes, is going through this heater. I don't know. doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but then neither did the on-off <laughs> switch in the end. So I think it's just an unusual arrangement. Um, for Done for some reason, I don't know why it's done. I guess we could assume this is the 6-volt leg here. Not, not the major heater leg this one here is. That's my understanding of this. Uh, how, how, I mean, maybe I'm wrong in even saying that this is not actually in the center, but I believe I've got it right. See, in a, a transformerless radio with all the tubes in series, there's no 6.3 volts to run a light bulb, or any voltage to run a light bulb. So they cheated out of here. And in m many cases, my understanding is the uh, B plus current flows through that light bulb too, although I may have that wrong. I may have that wrong. But not in this case for sure. So there we go. So that's two of the capacitors. Now there's one more. One more in here to look up. That's this little Hunts. And a little Hunts is hooked up to the same point as, as, as these. It's just this wire is going over, picking up a terminal on this tube probably a valid tube terminal. There's a resistor off it too. Not sure though. So Hunts, how much is that? 0 0.0047. 0 0.0047. So let's see if we can find this guy. So I, I think this terminal is nothing more than the B minus 
part of the B minus. So we're looking for another at point zero zero four seven hooked up to this wire here. And it could be almost anywhere. Do you see it? You've probably already seen it. Do I have a whole schematic up there? Yeah. Have to look and see what tube it's associated with. No, it's not showing up. 43 picofarads. Only on some models. Well, I didn't spot it. Hmm. It's inside the printed circuit, what they're calling the printed circuit. Why do they call it a printed circuit? I don't think it was printed in any way. Funny they'd use that term. Were there printed circuits around? Um, in you know the modern way, using the photographic techniques? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's what's inside here at all. Maybe I'm underestimating what, how these are made. I still haven't found that capacitor. 0 0.022. Okay, let's look back in the radio and get a better hint as to where it must be. So if it's associated with this pin, and that tube is uh, is in between the two IF cans, so that's got to be, I think, the 12 ba 6 That's in here. But if it is the 12 ba 6 then I'm looking up the right tube. 12 ba 6 So why don't you just commit some of this stuff to memory? <laughs> there you go. That's the answer to that. So it looks like every pin is busy on this tube. And uh, we are on pin number 2. The little capacitor is on pin number 2. 12 BA6. 6 here we are. Pin number 2. Wow. Well, that's just the uh, suppressor grid. That would normally be just tied to the cathode, pin number seven. And also it would be normally tied to the B minus. So look up at the uh, circuit diagram, it's pin number two. Uh, it's going straight to B minus. Where's this little capacitor? So pin number two is B minus, so it's just another connection point, I think. So I don't the capacitor has anything to do with the tube it's it's connected to. It's uh, it's, it's just it's just a uh, ground point, a B minus point. Okay. Um, what about the other the other the other? What about the other? So the other is going to the IF can there. Okay, not going to find it in there. Find it on the schematic. So looking on, this is the IF can closest to where the rectifier tube is positioned. Um, got it's got to be the signal flow's got to be. Well, wow, that's uh, that's audio, audio. And antennas over here, so it's got to be going this way. So we've got to say this is the first IF. Okay, looking at the first IF can and looking for a capacitor off one of the IF can leads here. Well, there's a 0.047 here. But I, I thought I saw a point zero zero four seven. Maybe not, maybe I'm mistaken. C three. That's off pin four today. Here's the dot. The dot is up here. Dot. So look for the dot. Look at the far corner we should find. Uh, either that's that's the that's where the capacitor is actually connected. Here, but actually way up here. Pin, pin four. Okay, pin four. Eh? 
pretty crowded in there. So I'm looking for the dot in the opposite corner, up in here. It's possible the dot is just hidden, you know, once you install one of these guys. Oh, well, here's, here's the dot on this one. That red, that red bit you see there. It's quite distinct, right up against the... the uh, CD dot. I didn't see any dot anywhere on there. Dog on it. Phooey. Okay, so that didn't work. Um, it's another another component hooked up. So this comes on to this terminal, and off that terminal is a resistor. Red, red, green. Two, two, one, two, two point two million. Two point two million, I think it is. So look for two point two million hooked up to the end of the little fence. So is there a two? There's a two point two right there. And there it is again. So did I just read that wrong? Maybe I did. Point zero zero four seven. It's pretty clear. Pretty clear what it says. I don't like this situation. This could, maybe this is a change. Um, there were there were some change orders for this radio. I'm gonna stop for a minute and read through that stuff. Okay, so some, something else I noticed uh, right right here on the schematic, which is just down below where we, we've been looking, is uh, this is for a different model. There's a light bulb on number 47. And you see where it's connected? It's connected across this filament here. Now what I, what I might not be thinking straight is, uh, and yeah, my <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what I might not be thinking straight. Um, so anyway, there, there's, there's an example of how this is lit across the voltage drop of this leg of the uh, 35W4. And if I hook this light up across the other leg, it would, it would pop too much. So there's lots of discussions around the importance of having this light bulb in place. Um, in some cases, uh, what's being said is this controls the inrush current. So you pop the light bulb instead of popping your tube, slows things down a little bit when you first turn the set on. I'm not sure that's really true. I don't know for sure, to be honest with you. Looks to me like the AC can just swing right through here, just like that. This guy's not. So it comes on fairly bright at first because all these resistances are low. So there is a rush of current does go through the bulb so if you took the bulb away the rush of current would be even less going through here so I mean there's a word out there as soon as these bulbs burn out you better replace them because once the bulb is out the rectifier or something's getting beat up every time you turn the radio on I'm not so sure that's true and then once the uh, tubes start conducting current uh, I don't think this bulb would change brightness Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know offhand if it would. So a lot of these do exactly what the dim lights that on my bench do. When they come on, they come on bright, they go down, and then as the radio comes to life, they, they show more and more current through them. I don't know about this arrangement. I don't know. Okay, but that's not what I'm really after. What I'm really after is... Here's a component layout, Jim. You could have been using this. Look, the dot is down here on this one, not, not where I thought it was. This is 4. That's the terminal that the capacitor is on. Where's the capacitor? It's not showing here. Okay, sorry, so me, did I get that on the screen? I'm, I'm looking at full screen here. There. I, I, perhaps, perhaps I didn't have some of this on the screen. I apologize for that. We didn't have this part on. This is what I was just talking about. The parts layout shows you. 
that's pin 4 R R R where, where's C16 where so where 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 do we find this is C3 I'm, I'm thinking the point zero zero four seven is C3 but the wrong size now that's just you know, I should not be in the comfort zone. There's C3 over there. C3 is sitting in the radio. I got C12, C3, um, C16. C16. C16 is uh, 0 0.047 somewhere in here. Okay, we're not going to look for that one right now. Stay focused on what we're looking for. The missing... The, the, the missing missing one. Now, they don't show the connections here. They just show the location. So for instance, they're showing a... One, two, three... C6. This doesn't really match. This is not really matching. Six. So how much is C6? And where is C6 on here? C5. Or how did they number them? They probably numbered them from left to right. Just so we can find five here. The next one should be six. The next number one should be six. Hey, where's all the capacitors? Must be with that on off switch. There's C8, C12. Did they number it in here? Oh, they are numbered in here. C9, C11, inside this package, C8. I don't see 6. Um, it's kind of weird. 16, 12. Um, it's always the capacitor you're interested in that you cannot find on the schematic. Have you noticed that? Oh my gosh. Huh. Not, I mean, not only is it physically missing, there, C6. 43 picofarad. So in uh, in microfarads, this would be oh 0. 0.00000 something. C6 on some and B598 models. B B598. I've got a 598 here. There's no B on it. Where's it going to? It's going to... And they show it tied to right, importantly tied to pin 1 on the mixer tube. Uh, okay, let's see if we can locate this. Pin, pin 1 on the mixer tube. Yeah, I don't even have to be doing this, right? You just get busy and change those capacitors, but... Uh, but, so uh, mixer tube. Mixer tube is this guy here. I said pin six. Let me just make sure the plug is pulled out on this radio while I'm doing this. Pin six, one, two, three, four, five, pin six. Pin six has the big filter capacitor on it. Did I count them right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's got this pinkish wire. The pinkish wire. Pinkish wire. Ties to that terminal. It's not getting near this capacitor here. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Got an extra capacitor and missing one. Same. Am I reading this number wrong? It really is a decimal point. Point zero zero four seven. So if we slide it over, that's forty seven hundred picofarads. And that's a long forty seven hundred is a long way from one hundred picofarads or forty three picofarads. That little capacitor is hooked up to this coil here. I think this is the coil it's connected to. So is there a capacitor in there I haven't noticed? Any down under? No. This is probably the oscillator coil. And in this radio the antenna coil is the antenna itself. That's really not said very well because uh, a lot of these radios have transformers. You have the antenna, and then you have a transformer, and then the output of the transformer feeds in. Apparently, not this one. Well, there has to be an oscillator coil. That's got to be it. This is just a little mysterious. Um, who are you, and what do you do? So maybe I've made a tracing error here and I'm overlooking something that could answer this question. Okay, so so well, we know this guy is hooked up to one side of the 22, the 2.2 and the 2.2. It's hooked up to the second IF. 2.2, it's not quite on the screen, I think. Where is it? Here it is, here. 2.2, and there it is, hooked up to a terminal on the IF. See model variations chart. And that's this. Well, it's not much variation. Nothing to do with, uh, with like, uh, my radio just has this resistor sitting here. This is not working out at all. So, so far, you know, one end is, is on the B minus. The other end, you know, the mystery capacitor, is hooked up to pin number two, just a terminal point. And then it goes over to the end of these other two reset two two capacitors. I thought that was B minus also. The other two capacitors. Yeah. C twelve and C sixteen. Both on B. Minus, which also comes up this bare wire and gets this guy onto B minus. So these are all going to B minus. And the B minus line is brought over here, and this guy's on it too. So he's hooked up to B minus. Didn't I conclude that already? And right at the same point is another resistor here. Wow, I'm not sure I can read that. It looks like 82 black and gold. Looks like 80, 82, 820, 82, something like that. But they don't necessarily are, you know, physically close on the radio, but not necessarily physically close on the uh, on the schematic. So I gotta find a, a 0047 that's hooked up. One side of it directly hooked up. You know what else? Well, if you look over here, this isn't connected here. This is passing by. If it's connected, they put a huge whopping dot on it. You can't be mistaken. So, somewhere really connected. Is this capacitor? Point 
zero zero four point zero zero five shown inside the printed circuit coming right off the volume control. I'm looking for a 0047. Could it be this guy got replaced externally? It'd be coming over to the volume control. Slider. Keep 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 looking. Keep looking. Keep looking. stuff to look for. We're out. Well, the only one that... This doesn't even hook up. Yeah, this doesn't connect. There's no connection here. That doesn't, that doesn't work. It's a totally additional capacitor. Yeah, there, were, there was another. There's more variations, I think, somewhere. I'm off to take a look for it. Well, there it is. Right there. Um, hmm. No doubt it's point zero zero four seven and it does not appear in any list on any diagram anywhere. It looks very similar to that Hunt's guy here. I think this is a Hunt. Just based on the color. What's it doing in there? Is that a replacement? The original ones were all wax, I'm guessing. That's a replacement. And then this one went in. Why? Why was there a bulletin on this radio? And I don't have the bulletin. Is this some old timer trick? What is that that it's hooked to? Oh, one of the terminals on the uh, first IF, which is terminal number four. Well, right off terminal number four. We, we know that. Let's look again on the schematic. Let's look again. Okay. Terminal, this is number one. Terminal number four. C3.047. C3 is tied from pin 4. So where where is so C C and it goes to, to the uh, B minus. And the resistor capacitor I'm looking at is going from that same IF terminal to the B minus point. So that's the replacement for for this one, but it's the wrong size according to this schematic. C3. Now let's see where where's C3 show up. Over here, which which radio am I looking at? Parts layout five. Let's look at the right diagram here. Okay, parts layout five ninety eight and four. C3 is over here. They have show three fairly large capacitors lined up here. Oh, really, Peanut? And my radio? Yeah, I see you there. You were already outside. And I got in trouble for letting you out because it's so cold outside. Okay, so there's three of them bundled here, but in my radio, the way they're distributed is uh, one is along here, C12 is along here, one is tucked in, in here, and then the third one, well there's three of them, it's right here. So, and the one, yeah, I do that, one of them, one of them is uh, 0 0.047. You're confusing me.
Okay, so I've written on these capacitors which capacitor I think they are. So if you look up at the uh, at the diagram up above here, this one here is my my radio. You see C C12 kind of in this position, it mines here. And you see C3, this is C3, it's roughly in the same spot as uh, shown. And then C16, it's way up here. Here it is though, it's connected the way it's supposed to be connected. How you could fit it down here, I don't know exactly anyway. And then we have the mysterious hunts over here. And you can look and see the terminal number 4 of the uh, first IF. And there's nothing around it. There's no capacitor around it at all. There's no where where a point zero zero four seven capacitor shows up. Where is this capacitor in the circuit? So it's going from pin four of the first IF to the B minus. So if we look at the schematic here, I can manage to get it up there. So I say pin 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 four. This is pin 4. It's going from here down to here. And there is no capacitor here. So, as much as I don't want to reach this conclusion, it's in there extra to everything. There is. So, so why would somebody do that? Why would they put that capacitor there? It's only, it's only a couple of possible reasons. One, they were smart enough to realize that capacitor was needed to overcome some kind of problem. What kind of problem? I'm not sure. It's right on the IF. I don't know. I don't know what the, what that's doing there. Um, number two, there was a bulletin released on this radio, and they went ahead and implemented the bulletin, which requested or required that extra capacitor to be installed. Um, and then the bottom line question for me is, what am I going to do? Now, the easiest thing is just replace it with one exactly the same on the assumption that whoever did it knew what they were doing I mean you know people don't just randomly jam capacitors into radio so there's got to be a reason either they they have thoughts in their own head about it or they've got it from from some instruction somewhere uh, so maybe what might be interesting is uh, uh, to fiddle around with that capacitor and to try to figure out why it might be there uh, um, me, I'm trying to decide whether I should go ahead and replace these and then fool with this one or start fooling with this one right now. Um, and by fooling with it, what I mean is I would have the radio operating and then cut this out and see what happens without it, what, what the difference is. Seems to me it's just weakening the uh, the IF there one way or another. It's draining off some of the signal. Maybe it's stopping an oscillation. Maybe this radio oscillates without it, and this was a method to to sort of maybe reduce the Q of the first transformer or something of that sort. I don't know. I'm just guessing away. Uh, for the sake of doing something, I'm going to replace these three now. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll consider what to do about the fourth one. I might as well, I mean, we might as well look into this one too. Why leave him out of the picture? So it's connected. It's connected to this terminal, which is right on the power line. And the other side of it is connecting to this pin on this tube. And which pin? Pin number five over on this tube. And what tube is that? That's the output tube, isn't it? Isn't that the output tube? Yeah, I think that's the output tube. Pin five of the output tube. So if we look on the output tube right here, and we say pin five not reported. Pin, pin five doesn't appear. Pin, pin 5 on the output tube, it's not neither of these. Um, so 
probably it's just an unconnected, uh, it's just a spare terminal there. 50C5. No, pin number 5 is the. Uh, oh, so there's two connections to grid 1 on this 2, pin 5 or pin 2. And I guess they've used pin 2 and pin 5. So pin, so pin 5 is the grid connection. Pin, pin 5 is the same as pin 2. So looking back at here, there's pin 2 on the grid. So off of here. Well, what, what, what am I supposed to be finding there? Another This capacitor? Holy smokes, I'm really good at finding niggly little things. <laughs> niggly. Here we are. It's got to be going here. Pin. Oh, that's pin 7, isn't it? Two, three, four, five, six, pin seven. Pin seven. Okay, let's look again. Uh, yeah, pin seven. Don't know how we got that. How did I get that counter from? Pin seven. Pin seven is here. There he is, right there. So the other side's got a 1.2 K resistor. The other side, well, good luck finding it off of this terminal. There's wires going everywhere. Um, yeah, and this, this goes on to the output transformer. You can see the wire disappearing through the hole. hole. So that's what that is. Kind of tucked under there. Okay, so uh, my understanding of this guy is uh, he's the last chance at draining out any RF that's made it all the way through the radio to, the, to this point. That's what I believe that is. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to do all four of those. I'm going to leave the uh, little hunts there, and uh, we'll see where we get. So I think on the last uh, video I showed this picture, but I, I missed I missed a chance to show another picture. So this is this is Walter Louis. He's the fellow who probably put in that point zero zero four seven, and he looks like one smart cat to me, boy. Just looks so intelligent. It's, he's staring back at me. But look at this picture. So here we see West End Radio. This would be on Mississauga Street in Aurelia. That's the main, the main thoroughfare, I guess you could say. And uh, where's Walter? There's Walter right there. So Walter's looking a little older in this picture. I'm gonna guess that this is right around the time that this radio was done. Uh, something like that. Look at the people here. These are guys are all working in this radio shop. He's got to have a buyer buying new radios. He's got to have uh, a couple sales people out on the floor selling radios. How many guys are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen people working in this shop. Wow. Well, it could have been any one of these guys. I mean, he, you know, Walter was a businessman, so he could easily have said, hey Fred, take a few minutes and fix up this radio. I'm going to turn it, I'm going to make it into an award. And uh, one of these guys is Fred. Where's the young guys? Where, where, where's the young up-and-comers? Where are they? That guy? That's that's the only <laughs> young up-and-comer? Man, a little whack of knowledge in these people's heads from back then. Desilu Playhouse. You can see an image in the window of another building across the street. Uh, so this might make it very easy for me to figure out where where this actually was on uh, on Mississauga. I think I'm going to try to do that because um, this building is probably still there. And not much. Like the Westinghouse, 
fourth annual white sale would look like it must be right around this time of year November getting ready for the winter Walter Louis seventh from the right one two three four five six seventh from the right from the right <laughs> one two three four five six there he is that's him for sure picture outside West End Radio his downtown shop Louis sent his war medals and uniform to Prime Minister Mackenzie King in protest after he was initially denied a business license. Can you believe that? After coming back from the war, uh, being so upset because you're being treated like a second-class citizen, and your method of protesting is to reject your past military history by sending it straight to the Prime Minister. And it worked. He got his business license right after that. And I'm sure he got all his military stuff back, too. Interesting story. I'm going to look and see if I can figure out where this actually is, based on that image, that unusual-looking building there. Well, after a fair bit of hunting around, I actually found a picture of the building that's reflected in uh, Walter's store. So in this book, Postcard Memories of Aurelia. I found this picture. And this matches exactly what's reflected in uh, in the store window. This part here is completely. But this is very, quite interesting. American businessman Andrew Carnegie donated a total of $56 million toward free libraries worldwide. These libraries became known as Carnegie Libraries. The sum of 2500000 was granted for the construction of 125 libraries in Canada. In 1909, after considerable debate, the Aurelia Council decided to apply for a $10,000 grant. I guess to build that. In a letter dated April 15, 1909, Mr. Carnegie's private secretary, James Bertram, stated they'd be glad to give 12500 to build a free public library provided the town commit to a budget of not less than 10% of that cost uh, per year to operate it. That's $1,200 to operate it per year. What it doesn't tell me is where is this building and what has happened to it. So I'm going to look into that now. <laughs> where is this building? There, there's another shot of it here. Public Library, Aurelia, Ontario. Huh. Okay, bit by bit I'm sleuthing it out. Okay, so if you look at this picture of his storefront, you see some red, what would be red brick here, and brick there. It's just a basic brick building. Now, if we look here, there it is. This would be the building. There's the red brick. They're standing in, in front in front of this building. Of course, you know, years and years have gone by and things have really changed. So the Carnegie Library would be across the street. So if we turn and we look, we find the Aurelia Public Library there, 36 Mississauga Street. And remnants of the, my wife tells me, remnants of the Carnegie Building are, are back, back in here somewhere. I don't see it at all. It looks to me like this is a totally new building, but maybe not. Well, there's a historical plaque. And I can't quite read it. That's too bad. There's some, so this is a historical location here in my town. So look at, look at that. So maybe, maybe some of this at all looks new to me. But, uh, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe some of it is old. Let's look at. Shame on me. I've never been in this library. Let's let's go here. We'll go right here. Take a look at the back side of it. Yeah, that's kind of a boring, boring thing. So I don't think anything remains of the original Carnegie Library. You have to go down here. Down here. And Walter's shop is right here. Cards and coasters, and keep it clean, coin laundry is what it turned into in the end. <laughs> okay, so here's the four capacitors I've changed. Let's check them out. 
and just see how bad these really were. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they're in bad shape. Let's start with this guy. I'm guessing it's a replacement done by Walter or his guys. His, his army of guys that he had there. I sort of imagine these shops have one or two people in them. <laughs> no. Okay, so watching the eye here. Let's see if I can just improve the lighting a little bit. Maybe not. There we go. So you can see the uh, eye opening at the bottom. 50 volts, what do you say? Oh, popped right open. Suspiciously popped open. Let's go with a higher voltage. Very suspicious. So what's suspicious is it shouldn't open that fast. It should be a little bit slower. So this is, what is this? This is a point, point oh 0.05. And you can see the eye isn't closing at all. So I think this is completely defective. I think it's uh, got no uh, connection through it. Let me get a different tester. That's one of the ways capacitors fail, is their, uh, their leads become disconnected inside. Let's see what this guy says about it. Hmm. You're not going to be able to read that. So it gives uh, C equals uh, 62 nanofarads. That's a 0.06. 0.06, and it's supposed to be, hmm, that's interesting, must be a 0.05. Well, I don't know, these two things are arguing with each other, these two instruments. Let me just try this again. Just Maybe I didn't make a connection. Okay, you get, it, you get another try. Back to 50. Nope, it's just, it's just, really indicating there's nothing connected to it. Like if I leave this lead open, that's what we get. I think this guy is open circuited regardless of what the other tester said. So that's uh, that would be a big problem potentially for the radio depending upon you know what position it's in. Generally speaking the parts are needed so... Okay, 50 volts Popping right open too. Hey, what's going on with my tester? Now oh, that's not quite right open. So this guy's still in good shape. I mean, it's a capacitance value might be a little off, but uh, I'm not even going to bother measuring it. So I think now we know why the radio worked to a fair degree when I tried it. Okay, how about this wax guy? How have you held up? 50 volts. Not so good. Not so good. And this guy. Fifty volts. It's good. Not so good at one fifty. A brand new capacitor, I can crank this thing right up to the top, 450 volts, and the eye pops open very rapidly. So, well, that explains why the radio worked. Now, now we're going to need an explanation for why it no longer works. Because I changed parts and made a mistake. Let's play the radio, and that'll be the end of the video for today. shop work because it's actually uh, it's pushing one o'clock in the afternoon here. I spent quite a bit of time researching for the uh, the Carnegie. Okay, plug it in. Now, oh, now I know. But it doesn't matter because I have the switch shorted. Leave it like that. Volume's down. Can you work? Mr. Radio going through the dim bulbs. Okay, behavior normal. 
the volume. What time is it? Did that say 420? Is that 420? Hmm. Okay. 113 volts. Well, I think there's a more volume. Tune it. Oh, I have to put a string string on this guy. the French. Can we find the French station? Probably not. So what have I done? I got another one of those shocks. For sure that was a tingle shock. Right off the edge of this panel. How can that happen? Hmm. How can that happen? Last thing we'll do is see why it is I come close to killing myself repeatedly with this radio. So I'm touching this. Ow. Okay, touching this and then just kind of running up along the side here. I suspect it's an AC voltage. I was hanging out of the wheel. Not the fiber board, of course. The fiber board is nothing. I didn't really want to get into this testing of this sort just yet. Oh! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sitting right up on top here. Don't really know what's going on with this. I think it's the connections to the light inside. It's been one continuous piece of metal. It can't be metal, can it? It must be some kind of clear material because the light's coming through. Well, that explains it anyway, I think. Oh, there we go. Ah, yikes, 100 and something volts. Right on the back of my little thumb. Okay. There we are, lots of lessons learned here. Panalescent lights, cool but dangerous. Okay, great to live dangerously. So uh, thanks a lot for watching this video. Um, tomorrow, what's left? Tomorrow is the hunt, the little hunt capacitor, figure that out. And then align the radio, and I think we're done. One more day on it. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for watching.